Thank you all very much, um, and you're all very welcome to the um, Institute of International European Affairs. My name is Alex White. Um, I'm Director General here, and uh, it's great to see you um, to see you all here, um, and to have the opportunity to uh, hear our distinguished uh, guest, Tony Collins. As I said to him earlier, I find it very hard to say Anthony. Uh, knowing for as long as I do, but Tony Collins, um, a former Advocate General of the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, and recently um, announced, uh, nominated to uh, the Court of Appeal by the government, and I think shortly to take up that role um, on, on the court. Um, prior to Tony's role as Advocate General, he served as a judge at the General Court of the European Union. That was between 2013 and 2021. Uh, where he was elected president of chamber for two terms, uh, starting in, um, I think that, that period began in September 2016. Tony Collins is president of the Irish Centre for European Law, an adjunct professor of law at University College Cork, and a bencher of the Honourable Society of the King's Inns. Um, Tony is going to speak to us for about 20 minutes um, of reflection, and then we'll open the uh, floor to questions um, from you, those of you who are here in the room, and indeed if you're watching us online, you'll be able to pop a question in through the uh, chat uh, function uh, that you'll be very well familiar with at this stage. Um, so, um, reminder that the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record, um, and if you are given to social media and are still on X um, or some of the other ones and you'd like to tweet or whatever it is it's you, you would like to do, you can use the handle at IIEA, but it's not compulsory. It's just if you're motivated in that regard. So um, once again, a warm welcome um, to the Institute. As we were reflecting earlier, it's not a great day. Um, the weather isn't good, but Tony had very little distance to travel since um, he lives just across the road. And if I could also welcome Murin Noonan um, joining us as well uh, this afternoon. And indeed, um, uh, everybody is welcome. I might just mention Niall Fenley, if, I'm at, if I may, just to note um, his presence here and uh, welcome also uh, to him, former judge of the Supreme Court. So thank you all very much, Tony. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for uh, that very generous uh, introduction, and thank you very much, uh, IEA for uh, IEA for uh, the invitation, opportunity to address you uh, this afternoon. I'm supposed to speak on perspectives on the future of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, I intend really to uh, uh, make this presentation deliberate a presentation in three parts. I'm going to say a few, few words about the role of Advocate General. I realise that some people are very familiar with the role, other people aren't necessarily, aren't necessarily. Secondly, I think some general observations on where the court is at the moment. And thirdly, then, I have three observations to make uh, as to, as regards its future. First, anyway, uh, to do with Advocate General. Now, the so Advocate General doesn't exist in our legal system, and you may be pleased to know it doesn't mm -hmm. exist in most of the legal systems of most of the member states of the EU either. It's very much a French... Tell us. Idea. Basically, what would happen is that at the end of the oral hearing, the Advocate General would get up and address the court. How orally, formal it is. And... Uh, outline what he thought were the important parts of the case, uh, perhaps refer to some of the previous case law of the court, and then propose how the court should decide the case. But you could have an Advocate General, for example, in, a, in, in let's say, straightforward criminal matter, suggesting, for example, that the penalty here should be, you know, should be three years or whatever. That's That's where it comes from. And of course, since the court, when it was established, uh, six member states, three which followed very strictly the French administrative law structure. The Court of Justice at the time was the Court of Justice of the Coal and Steel community. So it was an administrative law court, strictly administrative mm -hmm. law court, no reference procedure yes. of any kind. Then, of course, the Council, Conseil d'État model was the one that was followed, and therefore you have the Advocate General. And the Advocate General has since developed into sort of an independent institution of its own. Some people say Advocate General is generous. Uh, what do we do? Well, basically, one eleventh of the cases come across my birthday. desk or came across my desk directly. And what would happen? They're attributed to you, with obviously a reporting judge looking at the case. And when the case is ready at a certain level, the reporting judge prepares a preliminary report in writing in every case. 
and you look at the preliminary report and the preliminary report will make suggestions uh, as to how the case should be dealt with from a procedural point of view. It will also suggest solutions as to how the case should be decided from a practical point of view, may leave some questions open, but generally an opinion is expressed. And my job would be to say whether or not I agreed with that report uh, or to say, well, I agree with it in part or to say, well, what happens if we change this part here? We don't need then to do this. We don't need a hearing if we do it this way. Uh, we need an opinion in this case because I don't agree with reporting judge. So this goes on in the background and that's a lot of the work of the Advocate General. But what the public see, of course, is when the Advocate General delivers an opinion in a case. Now, until about 20 years ago, Advocate General gave an opinion in every case, even the most banal and straightforward cases, one page long. Belgium hasn't applied a directive in time. Therefore, uh, uh, Belgium is to be condemned. Um, now, the Advocate General only delivers opinions when there are new issues of law, when he doesn't agree with the uh, reporting judge, when the case goes to a grand chambre, uh, when the Advocate General wants to write an opinion, or sometimes when the reporting judge wants to write the opinion and the Advocate General doesn't really want to, but everyone's trying to be nice to each other and be nice and collegial. So it's the opinions you see. And of course, they are delivered as independent legal opinions as to how the case should be decided. Uh, once the Advocate General has done that, that's well, the end of the Advocate General's role in the case. The Advocate General has no role in the well. deliberations, has no influence right. in the background. That's it. It's over. So you deliver the opinion, you wait to see. The court can decide to follow or not, and the court does not have to give reasons why it doesn't agree with the Advocate General. Sometimes it's as plain as day. Sometimes you don't know exactly what went on. So it's an independent job. It's separate and apart. And I think it's one that gives one an opportunity. Perhaps it has been described that you are part of the institution or part of the court, but you're not actually of the court. You're, oh no, you're of the court, but you're not part of the court. And I think that gives one a necessary level of distance to allow one perhaps to make some observations on the uh, future of, of the court uh, of justice. Now, the Court of Justice, I think, has to be regarded as a genuine success story. When you think that it began with seven judges, two advocates general, four languages, and basically could be fitted into a building in Luxembourg, which is now has been expanded so it can be used as an art gallery, as a public art gallery. You can imagine this was an extremely small, and as I say, started off as a court that was solely dealing with administrative law matters in the regulation of the coal and steel industry at the time. I think it could be said that if the EU is a legal construct, then the treaties are, uh, are the frame, the laws are the bricks, and the court is the cement. Because without concepts such as primacy and direct effect, which the court developed in its own case law, the treaties would, I think, I don't think they would have been quite a dead letter, but they would have remained international treaties. You should not overlook the fact that despite all this incorporation of human rights law into our domestic legal orders, they are incorporated into the domestic legal orders under the control of our constitution, because there is no, it is the European Convention of Human Rights is an international treaty. If Ireland breaches the European Convention of Human Rights, the matter is ultimately resolved by the Committee of Ministers. It remains at that intergovernmental level. EU law is completely different. It's completely integrated into the system. And how has that come about? Through the concepts of primacy and direct effect. How did they come about? They came about because there was a procedural innovation in the original treaties. The creation of the reference for preliminary ruling allowed the citizen to access the European Court of Justice in cases where that was necessary to do so through the medium of the national courts. But the reason for that is simple, because EU law is always applied through the medium of the member state authorities, be they executive, legislative, or judicial. So that created in turn an interjudicial dialogue. Sometimes, sometimes, although there are some deviations now taking place in the analysis, it's quite clear to me that the reference for preliminary ruling procedure is not a remedy. It is a mechanism whereby judges speak to each other. A judge who needs, needs an answer to a question of EU law to determine an issue in a case before him or her may make a reference to the Court of Justice if that judge sits in a court of final instance must make such a reference. So you have this dialogue, and this dialogue, I think, has brought about two things. First of all, it is I think there is, an earn, there is a respect between the national judiciaries and the Court of Justice. There may be disagreements, but there is respect. That comes about because of the uh, to and fro of the uh, reference procedure. And uh, the other aspect is that it has allowed the court to develop a coherent case law in a large range of areas. 
and particularly through the mechanisms of primacy and direct effect. And the one that clearly comes to mind is the recent example concerning the rule of law. There is this value in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union, the value of the rule of law. What does that mean in practice? Well, it doesn't mean very, very much unless you can put it into something practical. How does it come into something practical? Because the court has interpreted Article 19.1 of the Treaty on European Union, which puts an obligation on member states to ensure legal protection in fields governed by EU law, not fields where EU law is actually managed or adopted legislation or, for example, in the case of the Charter, where a member state is implementing EU law. These are fields governed in EU, governed by EU law, very, very wide. By that mechanism, the court has been able to build and establish a, a case law in the area of rule of law, which has allowed the court to, to adjudicate upon matters. I mean, obviously, the, the, the application, interpretation of national laws for the national court, application to the facts is a matter for the national court. But the Court of Justice has been able to at least attempt, and I think in a, to a large extent succeed, in ensuring that certain minimum standards are complied with in national courts to ensure that uh, the rule of law is respected. And of course, there is another aspect to this as well, which is that if a court is not independent, impartial or established by law, not only is the member state in breach of its obligations under Article 19.1, but that court is not a court for the purposes of Article 267. It can't make a reference. We've had a recent example of this in a reference from the one of the courts, one of the divisions of the Supreme Court of Poland that was established by the Polish government for the purposes and effect of inter alia vetting election results. It made a reference to the court. The court basically said, this composition of that court is not a court because it doesn't guarantee, it doesn't respect the principle of independence in particular uh, it did respect the other two. It was established by law. And as for impartiality, I'm not sure where that would stand. Probably in practice not, but independence was the issue. So um, the court, I think, has been, is a bulwark uh, of defence of the uh, rule of law in the member states. But as I have pointed out in writing and orally, in my view, the greatest strength of the rule of law in the member states is the quality of judges at the first instance level. The majority of our citizens experience the legal system at uh, the first and second list instance level. If they are satisfied with the quality of the service and the treatment of the cases, then they will have confidence in the legal system generally. If the standards at that level fail, people can, will understandably be cynical as to what goes on at the higher levels of the system. And uh, I think that one of the great strengths of the rule of law in this country has been for 100 years, was that we've had our own court system for 100 years celebrated this year, was the establishment of a, a solid district court. Yes, judicial review exists to ensure that errors are not made. And yes, I'm sure we could all tell, those of us who practice can all tell some stories about some district court judges, but the general standard has been extremely high. And that has been something which means that people have confidence in the uh, legal system. That unfortunately is not necessarily the case in all of the member states. And you can see from looking at some of the cases, references made from Poland, the sort of carry on that would go on. I'm not speaking necessarily in terms of bribery or corruption or anything of this kind. I'm talking about harassment, I'm talking about people being promoted or demoted. I'm talking about in member states where you have a strict what's called um, legal judge. Uh, this is a Germanic concept where basically you must know your judge from the beginning. It doesn't function here at all. They can't understand how you could go into the high court and be told Judge X will deal with your case. And if he can't deal with it, another, she will deal with it later. It's just th this is beyond their minds. But in countries where you have that, then the formation can't be changed except by rules. But they are changed because people are being bullied and harassed. So you see this type of thing and you realise that um, we've done well to avoid that. And it's... Uh, essential importance for on a system based on the base of mutual trust. We had our own case here, the Selmer case, where uh, an attempt was made not to execute a European arrest warrant on grounds of the rule of law would not be respected in Poland. Where you have a system based on uh, mutual trust, it is necessary, I think, that the court intervened. And so we can see this very positive influence the court has had in ensuring that Europe is run as a, uh, a Rechtsstaat, as, as would be said in German. However, that does not necessarily mean that nothing remains static. And I think that uh, I have a number of observations to make on the future 
developments of the court. I think the court needs, nothing is perfect. The court, for example, in 1990, when I went over as a reform there, had 13 judges, six advocate general and nine languages. Uh, it now has 25 uh, judges. In fact, it's meant to be 27, but one seat, two seats are vacant, one because of deceit, death, one because a judge resigned early, 11 advocates general and 24 languages. General court has gone from being a court that had 12 members because it doesn't sit in plenary sessions. So it was just one per member state in 1990. Now consists of 51 judges. There are three vacancies. So in principle, it should be 54. In my view, the court in terms of size is close to its limits from, from, from a practical point of view. And the first observation I have to make is that the court and the system in general needs to start thinking about enlargement. Enlargement will happen whether we like it or not because enlargement exists for political reasons of political imperative. That's uh, to think, if we go back, you could say, well, why did this happen in 2004 with 10 member states? We can see clearly that we cannot have zones of non-law in the Western Balkans, nor in Central and Eastern Europe. So um, if you had 10 new member states joining in the morning, what would happen? Well, you'd have 30 more judges. There is no objective reason to have 30 more judges at the Court of Justice right now, particularly 20 in the general court. In any event, I believe there will be a review of the composition of the institutions with the next enlargement. The current idea, one for every one of the audience is going to go. It's already gone in the commission. We just forget that they didn't change the Lisbon Treaty, just the member states agreed they wouldn't implement the Lisbon Treaty. And if you, with all respect, you can sort of see it's fraying at the edge. So add another 10 in the mix. No. So we're going to have a review. So what are we going to do? Well, it's of interest in that regard um, because you've just had a big development in the court. The court, the general court was enlarged. Its membership was doubled on an incorrect premise advocated out of, uh, strange, strangely by some people but incorrect premise that the amount of case law in the court would expand almost in, uh, exponentially. That didn't happen. At the same time, you've had an increase in references from preliminary ruling, which has increased the burden of uh, work on the Court of Justice. So what you have at the moment then in effect is you have 27 judges will say, under a certain amount of pressure, and you have 54 judges, or under less pressure. But when the original proposal came to double the number of judges in the court during the debate, which I was involved in, it was very interesting to note that notwithstanding the provisions of the Nice Treaty that allowed for preliminary references to be sent to the general court, that argument wasn't really relied upon in the debate because it wasn't foreseen that that would happen. And there's a reason for that, because there's an objective reason why the court should only the court should deal with references. There's an issue of coherence. There's a question of finality. Uh, there was also a question a little bit of, this is the jewel in the crown, and how can you split the jewel in the crown? But that's precisely what's just happened. Uh, as of the beginning of October, in areas such as value-added tax, excise duty, common customs tariff, emissions trading, and passenger rights, references for preliminary rulings will go and be, will be addressed by the general court. Now, I think that's a good idea. But this opens up the question as to what's the difference between the court and the general court? I mean, I've no doubt this transfer is going to work. And when it works, the next question is going to be, what's next to be transferred? Consumer law? The court's building up quite a case law there. There's no reason why it shouldn't go. Public procurement, perhaps? Perhaps public procurement didn't go this time because there weren't enough cases. Intellectual property? Where does it stop? So at what point is the Court of Justice and the Court doing the same thing? Now, there are two ways of looking at this from the point of view of an enlargement type situation. One would be, in fact, to say this is perhaps we should just bring an end to the difference between the Court of Justice and the General Court and merge them back. After all, all the jurisdiction that General Court exercises used to reside with the Court of Justice. There is a problem relating to appeals and competition law matters. But apart from that, I don't see a direct obstacle. That would allow states more flexibility then, because, of course, we wouldn't need three judges per member state. We could say be made two and a half, two and a quarter, whatever it happens to be. Obviously, there have to be adjustment for advocates general as well, but it's important to point out that in the transfer of jurisdiction in references to the uh, general court, the general court has provided that some of its members may act as advocates general on an elected basis for three years at one time. That's necessary. So you're going to, you, the advocate general will not disappear. That is not a solution. The solution will be either, is. I think the solution will be one 
whereby you could have, uh, say, more advocates general, two judges per member state, two and a half judges. Another possibility would be, as has been suggested and sometimes said in speeches, that by removing all these so-called technical areas from the Court of Justice, the Court of Justice can become a constitutional court that can look, let's say, at constitutional issues. Now, there's a couple of issues about that. The first one is, is that, uh, is the, can you can describe the Court of Justice as a constitutional court? There's a big question mark over that because there isn't any European constitution. And the last time the electorates were consulted on this, they said no to European constitution. Yes, they eventually we ended up with the Lisbon Treaty, which is more or less the same, but that's not a constitution. It's important to bear that in mind. So if you say the treaty is a constitution in any event, when you look at the difficult areas of law the court has to deal with at the moment, important ones, data protection, you're not looking at the treaty provisions in data protection, you're looking at GDPR. So you're going to ship all the GDPR cases over to the general court while the court sort of sits up there and just deals with some general principles. I'm not sure how workable that is in practice. I'm not sure that's how EU law works at all. So some of this talk of constitutional court, in my view, is a little bit beside the point. There's another point I'd make as well, be careful what you wish for. We don't have a constitutional court, nor does Denmark, nor does the Czech Republic, but many member states do. And if you look and see who sits on the constitutional court, what you see is that constitutional courts do not consist of practicing lawyers. Our system is based on practicing lawyers. The Court of Justice has a mixture of people respecting the different traditions in the member states. But do we want to create a constitutional court where it will become, in some member states, will immediately think of, we have a former minister for justice who could do an excellent job on that court because that's who sits on these courts. Or we have a great professor who's never done any practical work at all, but we think he should go because he sits on our constitutional court, he should be on their constitutional court. I think, I say, be careful what you wish for. That's the first observation I make, but there is a challenge there and hard thinking should go into this before any decisions are made. The second issue is a structural one concerning mandates. At the moment, the mandates of all the members of the court, both courts, are six-year renewable mandates. And the only question I will put out to you is this. If the Polish government had decided some years ago that on its higher courts, all its judges would have six-year renewable mandates, I wonder would it have passed muster with the rules of the rule of law concerning um, the uh, immov immovability of judges. Now, of course, we know the court wouldn't have cut off, its, wouldn't have produced a judgment of cut off its own legs. But the fact is, there's a logical inconsistency here. The fact is, you look around and see what you have. Our system, you stay, you are nominated until you reach a certain age. In Germany, for example, it's a 12-year non-renewable term. In the Court of Human Rights, it's a nine-year non-renewable term. I'm talking about the German Federal Constitutional Court, by the way, in that regard. Um, there's certainly an argument about what's perfect. Nine years seems to be too short. Is 12 years good? Perhaps it is. Maybe 15, because a lot of people leave beforehand. It's not necessarily guaranteed they'd stay on. Then there are people who say, well, of course, people would leave who were, who were good and people who didn't would stay on. But whatever way you go about it, the uh, sustainability of the current system must be under question, particularly when you realise that uh, with some of what's been going on in relation to respect for rule of law on the executive side. Now, we have the 255 committee, but the 255 committee is uh, basically uh, equipped to give a yes or a no answer. It's not there, as some people recently I noticed in some other area of law, there to guide the composition of the court. There's no function in that regard. It simply says yes or no to what the member states propose. After all, the system is based on the idea that the member states, not the council, nominate judges. And this is just a control mechanism to ensure that they're not nominating people who are manifestly, as I would say, incapable of doing it. So this affects the manner in which the court operates as well, because this current system has led to a situation, we have a system whereby, for example, if you are elected president of chamber for of five judges, and they're sort of that's the workhouse, workhorse horse chamber of the court for five years, you can only be elected twice. After that, you're gone. You can, however, be elected president of the court for as long as you can be elected. And that didn't make much difference because until, until the 1990s, there was only one instance where a, a president of the court had served for more than six years in office. Since 1994, we've had nine years, 12 years, and now another 12 years serving as president. Now, the only question I'll ask about there is, is that 
I'm not sure that way gives a serious management question arises. Yes, there's a mandate and there's nothing wrong, there's nothing invalid about this, but there's a management issue here. In this jurisdiction, for example, you can only be president of court for seven years. It doesn't matter how good you are. It's not a judgment on the individual. It's a question of making the system work. And that's even more acute at an international level where you have people nominated by 27 different states. Uh, it also has very strange byproducts. For instance, 255 committee, which I mentioned, is an extremely important body. It's appointed by the council. However, it's nominated by the president. Now, if you've got a different president every six or seven years, then you might have, as president, one bite of the cherry, perhaps two, depending how things fell out, because the mandate of the committee is four years. But if you're there for a period of 12 years, you then actually, in fact, can more or less direct the composition of that committee over a 12-year period. Is that necessarily what we want? We have to look again at the question of the length of mandates. We have to look at the question of what is best to do in the circumstances. Um, uh, but the status quo, as I see it, is up for grabs and will have to be renewed in the context of um, anything for now. I think at this stage, I may have spoken, uh, I, I don't know where I am time-wise. Very good. Excellent. No, I'm just, I haven't been looking at my watch. Uh, what I would like to say uh, is a, another issue which I think needs to be, needs consideration. Um, I'm not proposing any solution here, and I think particularly uh, we in Ireland must be very careful uh, about addressing this particular topic, and that is the question of the internal working language of the court. Uh, if you look at the court statute, that is a that highly political matter. Uh, in fact, the court has no working language. It has a de facto working language, but it does not have a legal working language. Because if you look at the statute, you'll see that requires a, a regulation adopted unanimously by the council. So that's one of the reasons why English is still an official language of the EU, because to amend the regulation, you need um, unanimity. And English remains there because you won't get unanimity to get it out. So it doesn't fall and go with the member states. So um, why do I mention the question of language? Well, there's a, first of all, the Court of Justice in particular needs a platform language. It just has to have a platform language. It's not going to function any other way, unless you say that technological developments are such that you don't need a platform language anymore. I don't know if we're close to that or not. I'm just saying that's one possible solution. Mm -hmm. If you have a platform language, however, the question that really arises is you could choose any language. And there's many, many strong arguments in favor of retaining the status quo, particularly because everything has been done like that to date. And French does lend itself, I think, uh, as a language to uh, use in this particular field. It's quite precise. I mean, I think it works possibly. It, it certainly can be more precise than English. And it doesn't have the disadvantages of being perhaps too long and too detailed because you have languages that are just simply too detailed. But one always has to bear in mind that you're dealing here with human beings. And I think one point that's very important is the uh, courts are supported by a large backup staff, particularly the backup staff that are closest to the members, the referendaires. Referendaires are sup not supposed to, it's, men, it's a temporary job and you do it for a number of years. You then may do something else. You may come back as a member, it's happened with my case, but I came back to practice for 16 years afterwards. It would, it, we need referendaires who more or less represent the member states. And the reality at the moment is that too many of the staff, notwithstanding their excellent quality, are coming from a very small number of countries. You're getting a large number of people from France and Belgium. Where are, if you go northeast of Luxembourg, you're increasingly finding very, very few people coming. That is a worry in the long term because it puts the system to some extent into a situation of disconnect. Even if the people don't necessarily go back to their home, home countries to work, even if they end up working in Brussels or so on, they have some connection back there, which means that people can see how the system operates. And uh, I think, therefore, that there will have to be some reflection. At, it, it's, I certainly don't think it's something that's uh, easily dealt with, and I think it's something which probably in the first instance needs to be sorted out in-house, inside the court. But the status quo looks increasingly fragile as time goes on. Unless, as I say, somebody comes up with some miracle a technological solution that means that we can all talk to each other in whatever language we want and your uh, mobile phone will uh, broadcast it back to the uh, listener in his or her uh, mother tongue. Thanks for your attention.